administration or payroll. We knew that. <laughs> um, or the Department of Health number, I forget which one, but they mm -hmm. that's a number that fluctuates based on building and I don't know all what they put into that births and I don't know what all they count. Uh, so, and remember Department of Public Health or Chatham Health District rather does um, all of the um, restaurant licensing and um, inspection and uh, does all of the any any uh, commercial service that requires a license, so restaurants, hair salons, nail places, um, you know, all of that. They also handle uh, sanitation inspections, so that's uh, septic systems and those kinds of things, both commercial and and uh, and residential. And then, of course, they provide all the public health side uh, as well. Excuse me. It's pretty good, do you think? Pardon? I said I'll go through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. What's that? So much we can do about that. No, no, no. It's what it is. And it's busy with the lake, too. Yeah. Okay, next up is police administration. So I get to sit at the head of the table. <laughs> oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, as you all know, my name is Dennis Wessner, and I'm the chief of police for the town of East Hampton. Um, and I thank you for having the opportunity to speak to you today for the proposed budget for the police department. Uh, before I let you go on the actual budget increases, I'd just like to provide some background about my budget. Uh, let me first start off by saying this police department budget is a public safety budget, not a mere operating budget uh, for just any town agency, not that the town agencies are not important. The 17 police officers presented in this budget are responsible for 24-7, 365 coverage to the police community, to the community in which we serve. They do their job sometimes in conditions which others would run away. We run into danger, not away. They do so knowing that maybe one day they may not make it home, and assaults against police officers at an all-time high. In 2020, we saw 60 officers nationally who were feloniously killed in the line of duty, which is a slight decrease from last year, thankfully. Firearms were used at 81% of the time. But what is disturbing was the increase in ambush-style killings of police officers. 12 ambush attacks on officers in 2022 represent a 50% increase from last year, we only have to go 30 miles to our west to see Bristol, Connecticut, where three officers were ambushed when over 80 rounds were fired and two officers died. I know this year is no different from any other year. No one wants to raise taxes. No one wants the mill rate to go up. And I often hear it's not a good year to increase staffing or to increase our overall budgets. But when will it ever be a good year? Something is always happening that affects our economy, whether it's COVID, inflation, or overseas conflicts, just to name a few. Six of my officers live in town and one additional officer owns property in town and he pays real estate taxes. So seven of my officers would be directly affected by any increase in taxes based upon my budget. In April of 2018, when I was hired, we had 15 full-time officers. At that time, I had several conversations with the town manager about my wishes to increase staffing in the department. I told him my goal was eventually to get to 20 full-time officers, which I knew at the time was aggressive. Based upon our staffing levels at that time, there were far too many times when there are only two officers working. The department holds the R1, which is the first responder license for the town. And we are required to respond to all medical calls as well as other calls for service. Oftentimes, we receive multiple calls at the same time, such as a domestic or a CPR call. 
And when only two officers are working, that leaves no other officers to cover the town. Yes, we can always act for mutual aid, but sometimes they may be busy as well. But what happens if two officers are tied up at a serious call and another serious call comes in like a medical? Well, this happens rather often. In fact, this incident happened on March 7th, 2023 at 6.50 p.m. Two officers were working the evening shift and they both responded to a call in which a person was reported to be in a bathroom threatening suicide. Located in the bathroom was a pair of scissors, which provided the person with the means to harm themselves. While the officers were tied up with this call at 7.01 p.m., a call came in for a 68-year-old man who was reported that he was having chest pains. Now, I was on my way home off duty, pulling my assigned cruiser into my driveway when I heard the second call come in. Knowing that there were only two cars working and there was gonna be a delay in the response for the medical, I called the senior officer on the scene and asked him, how often or how long do you think it would be before that officer would be able to clear one officer to go to that medical where the 68 year old man was having chest pain? Now, mind you, I live in Colchester, Connecticut, right off of uh, exit 18. Probably on a good day with lights and siren, probably doing 80 miles an hour, it probably would have taken me 13 plus minutes to get to where the medical was. The officer says, I could probably safely clear in 10 minutes. So I made the decision to let off that officer clear, go to the other call because he would be able to get there a lot sooner than me. The problem is 23 minutes elapsed from the time the call to the time there was a first first responder on scene. Fortunately, there was the Middlesex paramedic that responded almost nearly at the same time. And I'm not here to say anything about the ambulance, but it took 40 plus minutes to get an ambulance on scene because our first ambulance was already tied up in the first call. I've always set out to figure out what our actual staffing levels are. And in 2018, they were about 50% of the, 56% of the time, two officers are working. Um, it fluctuated between 58 and 56% at the time. And based upon that, and the efforts of the town manager, the board of finance and the town council, Back then, it was approved in 2019-2020 to get me one additional officer up to 16. During the calendar year of 2019, our staff levels still showed 50% of the time we only had two officers working. This is because even though we had been approved for additional staffing, we had not hired and trained the new officers approved for that budget. During fiscal year 2021, I was again very grateful that the Board of Finance, Town Council, and the town manager allowed me to hire an additional person to bring us up to 17. The department, like every department across the nation, has had difficult times filling our positions. Um, it's still affecting departments today. With the added position in 2020, we were able to drop the percentages down to 49% in which two officers were working, which was fantastic. In 2021, the number jumped back up to 52%. And during 2021, we had very difficult times impacting our staff. One officer was in, injured in a motor vehicle accident. He was out for two months. One officer was out with an arm injury that occurred off duty, which put him out for a month and a half. Four officers were out with COVID. And if you remember back in COVID, the rule was 10 days out, don't come back until the 10 days are in place. And finally, I had one officer who was a member of the United States Air Force Reserve who completes monthly drills once a month and two weeks a year. This officer completed a special two-week drill in advancement of his employment. In 2021, the budget year, I put in for one new additional officer and the conversion of a current sergeant's position to a lieutenant's position, and both positions were ultimately denied. The Board of Ed, I'm sorry, the Board of Finance did approve, and I appreciate the lieutenant's position, but it was ultimately denied by the town council, and it was denied at the town council level by a vote of 4-3. In preparation for the 2023-24 budget, I again looked at my current staff. During 2022, um, the percentage of times that two officers were working was at 51%. Based upon these facts and others I will explain, I again requested this year one new position and again asked for that sergeant position to be converted to a lieutenant's position. Our staffing levels are very important as we need additional officers to provide the level of service that citizens and visitors in the town of East Hampton want and desire. There are several areas, in my opinion, we are deficient in. 
we lack a detective position who would be tasked with investigating all serious cases such as sexual assaults, crimes against juveniles, robberies, burglaries, and identity theft cases. Currently, if an officer is assigned to one of these cases that a detective should be handling, the officer must investigate the case along with his other duties. When he rotates to the midnight shift, they bring the case with him. It's not an efficient way to investigate a serious case such as a sexual assault, nor is it acceptable to the victim where the victim have to have to leave a call, a message on the officer's phone who is either currently working the evening shift or the midnight. Follow-up investigations with judges and prosecutors normally occur during the day, not on the off two works. The increase in one additional officer will not give us a detective position because I don't I, because I want to keep the percentages that there are only two officers working down. I will ask for that position in following years, but I present this as proof as our need for additional staff. Additionally, I have a serious need for a second in command position, which is a lieutenant's position. In 2014, the then chief Sean Cox understood the importance of a second in command, and he presented to the various boards a request for a second in command, but it was never approved. With the added requirements placed on departments across the, uh, the state as a result of the passage of the police accountability bill, there are more mandatory tasks placed on departments than ever before. The bill, which was passed by our legislators in Hartford, there is now a mandatory requirement that all police officers carry the body worn cameras. There is also a mandate that all police vehicles have a in-car camera system. In. There is also a requirement that departments must either achieve Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agency, commonly referred to as CALEA, or Police Officer Standard and Training Council post-accreditation by December 31st, 2023. We have decided to go with post-accreditation as it is state-specific and it is more cost-effective. The Police Officer Standard and Training Council Tier 1 accreditation is required by December 31st, 2023, which actually our actual appointment that we have to achieve this we already have our inspection date is August 8th of 2023, which is well sooner than December 31st. Tier one accreditation involves 121 standards. Post accreditation is a three year cycle for a total of 322 standards, which are contained in this book. Once the department gets to year three, the process starts all over again. It's never going to end. It's not one and done. It will be going on until it's either repealed, which it's not gonna happen, or some law changes where we don't have to do it. Each standard has multiple bullets that must be met and proofs for each standard every calendar year must be placed in the file. That's 322 standards every three years. This is a huge task and is very time consuming. The department has approximately 104 general orders, and to date, we have redone 43 of the 104 general orders. This is not an easy process, and it's very time consuming. From January 27th of 2022, when I started keeping track of the hours I spend on accreditation during my off-duty hours, to date, I have spent over 66 hours, mostly on Saturdays and Sundays, working on general orders or accreditation at home. I don't think it's fair that I should have to put in that many hours off duty on the weekends to accomplish this accreditation requirement. I'm all for doing more, but at some point, there's gotta be a limit. Additionally, every general order that is changed must go to the town council for approval, as you can attest, as required by the town ordinances. Many agencies dedicate a full-time police officer to this task, and several chiefs have stated that on average, that police officer will spend 20 hours a week on accreditation. This is 20 hours a week that I don't have to dedicate to accreditation because I'm already spending 66 plus hours on the weekend doing it. One of the duties, the most important duties of the lieutenant would be accreditation. The other duties will be overseeing the department's training to ensure officers maintain the required accreditation and certifications. One of the other things they would oversee with the body-worn camera and in-car camera systems. Sometimes downloading these camera systems can take hours uh, in preparation for court. And additionally, the lieutenant would be responsible for the investigation of complaints made against officers, which thankfully we have very, very, very few. 
But if they had one, we could investigate, he could investigate uh, this and review it, forward it to me for possible discipline. It provides another layer of review in the investigation of complaints for transparency. And additionally, it provides a succession plan for when eventually I leave, for the lieutenant to potentially step up and become the next chief of police for the agency. The sergeant, if a sergeant was here and applied for that job, he would have no chance. And it's my job to train the person to take over for me. So the question I'm sure you're asking yourself, does the increase in staffing really lower the percentages? And the answer is yes. In 2018, 2019, we were between 55 and 56. In 2022, when things were good, we were at 49. In 2021, we had a little bump because we had hiring officers, officers in the academy and officers in FTO. We were up to 52. In 2022, we're back down to 51. It has been mentioned uh, in one of the board meetings that crime level in town does not justify additional positions. I would have to disagree with that. And I present, present you with some of these following illustrations. Take one. Thank you. Picture number one, the first one you will see, was an armed robbery of the subway. Even though it was in 2018, it was an armed robbery of the subway where money was taken. Fortunately, we were able to catch the person right down the street. The next one is in April of 2021, 40 bags of heroin were located in a vehicle at the intersection of Middletown Avenue and Skinner Street, suspect arrest. In 2021, department members responded to a burglar alarm at the building at Sears Park. Police located a man who had entered the building. Subsequent investigation revealed the person was illegally in possession of a Glock handgun in which the serial number had been removed and was also in possession of a half a pound of marijuana. In May 22, which I'm sure most of you heard, department members acting on as a tip responded to a residence in town and located multiple ghost gun AR-15 style rifles in various stages of assembly including one that was fully converted to fully automatic or basically a machine gun. In addition to the rifles, three ghost gun polymer handguns were located, also 12 high capacity magazines and approximately 1,000 rounds of ammunition, as well as a bullet resistant vest. There was also what we thought was a pipe bomb present and due to the efforts of the Connecticut State Police, they determined that it was an inert device. In 2022, a vehicle stopped for speeding and 40 ounces of marijuana, 12 individual bags of marijuana, edibles, LSD, THC, vape liquids, and cash were located. And sadly, in November 22, a man was arrested for sexually assaulting a local girl. He was charged with sexually assault first, sexual assault fourth, and risk of injury. And I mind you, this case was successfully investigated and a warrant was obtained due to the efforts of the officers without the assistance of the detective. In this case, in my opinion, should have been handled by a detective. In December of 2022, members of the department executed a search warrant after a lengthy drug investigation and ultimately arrested two people. Found inside the residence were 500 assorted illegal pills of which 140 were pressed fentanyl, 70 bags of fentanyl packaged for sale and another container of fentanyl containing 380 grams. But just recently, February of this year, David Bollinger was sentenced to 25 years in prison for sexually assault that took place in 2018. Due to COVID and uh, prosecutorial delays, the case obviously took this long. Um, but he was charged with possession of child pornography um, as well as sexual assault. The prosecutor in this case credited two officers, Officer Jim Frito and Sergeant Bergen, for a successful conclusion of the case. And most recently, in February of 2023, the department received a call indicating a man was inside his residence threatening to kill himself with other family members present. Department members responded and were able to secure a perimeter around the house, make contact with the family members, and get them to safety. And after repeated public address announcements over the PA, we were able to safely get the individual to surrender after about an hour of negotiating. Located in the basement, 
where the adult male was, was a loaded 357 Magnum with a hammer cocked back, which those of you know anything about firearms takes about two to three pounds of pressure and that gun would have went off. We do a lot of good things, not just criminal things. Um, we do a lot of things with the community. We hand out slap rices to the kids. Um, we, uh, last year, all of the schools uh, during Law Enforcement Appreciation Week, um, they painted the lobby of the police department with more posters. Um, every stitch and white wall and wood in that lobby was covered with things that children had given to us. We go to daycares, interact with the kids, um, we conduct toy drives during the annual Christmas stuff a cruiser, which usually turns not into a stuff a cruiser, but stuff a trailer. Um, and those uh, gifts directly go to needy children in town. We interact every year with local uh, Cub uh, Scout packs. We do community events in the park. Um, and we do the department's Canada Care program, which notifies school administrators of youth who may need a little help during the day. Recently, the Board of Ed was able to get three armed security officer positions approved by the Board of Finance, Town Council, and ultimately the voters to the tune of seventy-five to $80,000 for half year salaries during a mid-year appropriation. In fact, a member of the Board of Ed used my very own statistics of the percentage of time there are only two officers working, plus the killing of two Bristol police officers as a basis for the immediate request for the mid-year hire. <laughs> I am not and never will be against these positions. I will not. As a matter of fact, I embrace the armed security officers. And in February during the break, uh, the East Hampton Police Department and the security officers did joint training in the middle school for active shooter training. And I am committed and always will be committed to train those armed security officers. But I just ask, am I doing something wrong? Do certain individuals just not like the police? Can someone please tell me why I can't get my staffing approved when others can? I asked to convert a sergeant position to a lieutenant's position with no additional increase in staffing for about $25,000, and it was denied. And I will tell you, it's my fault that the $25,000 was in there. It actually shouldn't have been higher back then because I failed <clears> to put in the fringe benefits. But the average taxpayer in town back then who pays real estate taxes would have seen an increase of approximately $6 or about two Diet Cokes. I'll remind you that currently there are approximately 1,800 students enrolled in the East Hampton school system. And EHPD is tasked with protecting approximately 13,000 residents, give or take on a given day, including those 1,800 students 24 7, 365. And because those armed security officers are not police officers, we still continue to go to calls at the school. And I will attest on a sidebar, uh, when Superintendent Smith mentioned yesterday about the desire uh, and the need for certain professionals in the school due to uh, mental health, he is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, we, the police, responded and what we call do committal paperwork to involuntary send use to the hospital, three of them in, in, in a week and two days. Never in my career as a police officer have I seen that many people get committed on one week. There is a, a severe mental health problem that the schools are dealing with. But the lack of additional staffing and the percentage of times there are only two officers working is a disaster waiting to happen in my opinion. I have several pages of, of indications when there are only two officers have been working and something else has happened. But due to time, I will not go into that entire list. I outlined the, the most specific one that we just had where we had the suicide attempt or what one tried to commit suicide in the medical. But trust me, there are many more. I have actually had to take stolen vehicle recovery plates as the chief when people walk in the lobby because I have no one to say. I'm not above working. I love working. 
In fact, sometimes the guys don't want me to go to calls, but I go to calls. Um, but that's just them. That. I've been a police officer for over 35 years, of which four years and 11 months has been as chief of the town of East Hampton. And I love it. And I believe I'm a good judge of my staffing level. Unfortunately, the town budget does not get the exposure the Board of Ed budget receives, but I think it's equally important because when people look to move into town, two things they look at, they usually look at the schools and crime. The brand new police department was built with expansion capabilities, 22 male lockers and four female lockers and additional office space. Why not let me use it? I know the answer to that was rhetorical. Obviously someone envisioned the department expanding because if they didn't, they would not have built extra space. Let me expand. Let me increase services. Recently, an individual called me who lives on Smith Street and says, Chief, how come you don't do a, like a, a program called um, Citizens Academy? Thank you. Um, a Citizens Academy. He goes, I work in, in Newington and they allow, if you work there, you can go. Why don't you do a Citizens Police Academy? Well, some of you have been around a lot. I have had been putting that in my goals. Well, it's a goal that's really not attainable with my current staffing level. And I told them such. I'd love to do it, but I don't have the manpower dedicated to do a six or seven week program. Um, this budget, I'm asking for one additional officer and the conversion of a sergeant position to a lieutenant's position at an increase of about $163,810. Additionally, I'm asking for an increase of $7,500 in line item 5590 to cover the cost of an additional speed monitor device license. I'm sorry, 5590. I'm switching gears too quick. Uh, please, please, that man. Yeah. 5590. Yeah. So the increase is uh, $1,500 for another speed monitor license. And the reason being is you've probably seen them around town. Those speed monitors are not just stagnant. They report information back to me. I can access that information online. And a lot of times residents call in and, um, and they have a complaint about speeding. I go out there, set the speed monitor out, leave it out there for a week. And once we're done, I download it. And then I call the person back, email the report that is in the actual speed monitor. And we discuss it, uh, discuss the strategies to put officers on the street at a particular time, or maybe sometimes I show them that the speeding really, perceived speeding was really not there. So the license allows me to have that reported information. I can actually extract it. If I don't have the license, it just basically is dumb. It just sits there and flashes the speed. The additional is an increase of $6,000 uh, in monies um, that we are allocating on a yearly uh, basis, um, and that is for our maintenance license and storage fees for our body worn cameras and in car camera systems. Our yearly cost is approximately $22,759 um, for our camera systems. That covers uh, maintenance, that covers the licenses, and the biggest part of that entire cost is for storage. It's off site cloud based storage. We are currently offsetting the 227 with leftover money that was allocated in capital when uh, the capital committee allocated roughly in the neighborhood of $170,000 for the actual project. So you subtract actually what the camera costs were, and then we're using that remain, remaining money to pay off the yearly uh, storage fees. I'm going to interrupt you, please. Absolutely. Um, so I'm lost. Police administration. Yep. 5590. Correct. Is 7,500 increase. I, I thought you said 6,000. The 6,000 was specifically the additional cost. Oh, so it's not listed here. Uh, well, it's it's encompassed. My okay. apologies. Okay. Yeah, you're right. So the $7,500, it's not broken down exactly. I'm just, I, I want to break it down for you so you know exactly where it's going. Okay. From. All My right. Apologies. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that, that $6,000 is the um, really amount that we're putting in there. The goal is to get to like the 23,000 mark. Um, so we're sustainable, uh, but we didn't want to go from zero to 24 in one budget year. So we're doing 6,000 a year. We're taking that 6,000 out and taking the remaining 
from the fund balance left in the capital for the entire body of the camera project. Mm -hmm. And uh, additionally, in the uh, 5810 account, um, that is under, I believe that's a piece admin as well. Um, you're going to see a charge of $4,000. That is um, Officer Pekar. Uh, he's been here. Uh, that's in your regular patrol. Regular patrol. Right. Right. 5810. Um, Officer Pekar is planning to retire in either November or December. So his replacement uh, will have to attend the police academy um, unless we can find a certified officer. If we find a certified officer, we won't need the $4,000. But that $4,000 is the cost to send the officer to the police academy uh, in Meriden for six months. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we have had to um, fund that. It used to be fully funded by the state. But about four or five years ago, the state started charging us. And, and if I may, in the new equipment uh, line item where the 163.810 is, there is a um, contained in all that, that money is in there, is a $3,000 amount for the department to participate in a regional computer lab with the Middletown Police Department. Um, so far, Meriden, Cromwell, Portland, Berlin have all agreed to sign on to a regional telephone computer type lab. Currently, Middletown purchases all the license and owns the equipment, um, but they're looking for sustainability. So each town that signs on would have access to the equipment 24-7. We wouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, the equipment hardware, we're just that $3,000 is going towards the licensing. What's this, this lab do? So, very good point. First of all, for all the geekies here, the licensing is for the Cellbrite, um, which is, we're shaking the heads, mm -hmm. you know what that is. So, it's a very, um, very techy piece of software that can actually, if you put in uh, parameters, it can go through and, and search the data. So, what does it get us? A lot of the, the instances now we're dealing with, people are doing things that they shouldn't do on their phone, sometimes recording criminal events, sometimes taking pictures of things they do. Um, in one case, we had a, uh, an individual recorded on video, um, let's just say uh, some inappropriate behavior. We were able to get the phone, extract and get the video. Even if you delete it, it's there. Right now, the only way to do that is either go um, to a regional lab that is located uh, out of Capital Region. It's housed in Manchester. Or go to the state police or beg Middletown PD to let us do it. You can only beg so long before they say, mm -hmm. uh, but we always talk about regional. What can we do, you know, with less but more? This is one of the efforts. Um, the officers will have 24-7 access to get into the PD. Um, if an officer has a phone, he or she goes over there and just performs the extraction him or herself. Um, it's also a lot quicker. That's what we're looking for. Um, right now, we have a, um, a burglary at uh, local peril, and we also have a burglary at another resident um, where we know it's the same individual, and right now we're getting search warrants to examine his phone. And that's probably only the only way we're gonna be able to lock the person to the crime. Um, the technology is way above. Uh, my computer geekness, uh, but it's I've seen what it works. They actually did a presentation in this room, and it's fabulous. They can actually do geofencing around a particular tower and track them. Middletown shows a case where they tracked an armed robbery from Hartford right down 91 into Burger King and actually Middletown, and they followed it just by the um, the GPS coordinates on the phone. Very extensive, very extensive. So that 3,000 is there. So. Hope I covered everything and answered all your questions. And I know that you're going to prove everything, and I really appreciate that. Very <laughs> but honestly, um, if there's anything you know, anything you can do, I know I kind of went fast because I didn't want to take up too much time with Matt Walton's. So, um, I'm very, I'm very passionate about this budget, and it's you see from the books and the town manager alluded to last night. 
we don't take it lightly and we know the budget is tough and we know that and um you know we if you look at the numbers expenditures to date in my current budget there are some line items that i have not spent a lot of money in because i know through um keeping track of certain things my overtime budget is going to be overspent and i'm trying to save as much as i can so i don't go over too much over budget my goal is not to get the budget but we've had a lot of things that have went on this year that, that have hit my overtime budget um right so now how does an additional officer affect your overtime budget <clears throat> potentially so it's a very good question you asked that dean markham asked jeff joke of that three years ago and jeff did a nice big spreadsheet and i would have to have five officers jeff four or five officers before I think something like it, that. It, it would start to affect so no impact no impact right. So um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, that's all right. Um, I, you were really, effectively wrapping up. Then. Yes, <laughs> that's my clue. He just put the fork on me. And yet, yet, yeah. Um, but that's it. Yeah, I'm effectively wrapping up. I mean, I don't, I don't put the budget for lightly, but it's we're at the point now where we we need some help. You know. Um, these unfunded mandates, uh, mandates that were passed by legislators are just very difficult. Um, I had a conversation with someone uh, right before this meeting about accreditation. Some of these standards, one standard can, can affect you know, 10, 12 bullets, you know, and it, it, it's, it's tough, it's tough. And um, Allison and the town manager both know that these general orders, there's six more that are going to the town council. It's, it's difficult. I don't mind working, but it's getting a little bit tiresome. Yes. So, with so that, I have a question. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we talked about this last year, and it just never went anywhere. Um, I don't remember the reasons why you couldn't hire a retired officer yep. to do the paperwork. He'd, he'd know the terminology. He'd be uh, aware of the, you know the culture, et cetera. Hiring someone to do accreditation, let's say um, they paid them $30,000. That $30,000 to hire someone to do accreditation would solve one thing, accreditation. Given that same $30,000 and change, I would solve accreditation. I would solve training. I would solve second command. I would solve a succession plan. And that certified officer all right, would be able to do investigate the complaints. So I'm looking more bang for my buck. I don't, I don't understand because to hire an officer and train him yep. is very expensive. Correct. It's not $30,000. So I'm missing something. So I have four sergeants right now. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to take one sergeant, make him a lieutenant, at the cost of roughly thirty thousand dollars of fringe benefits and whatever bump in salary we give him or her, mm -hmm. no increase in staffing. It's the only cost associated with that is that like thirty thousand dollars, and that's for um, the promotion, fringe benefits, and any uniforms that we would have to do to basically remove his sergeant stripes and put lieutenant's bars on. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's only solving one of my problems. And that's not what I'm looking to do. I'm trying to take the money and solve as many problems as I can. But then that wouldn't that take an officer off the street? That's why I asked for another one. Ah. <laughs> so they are tied. And you're right. Um, as you know, last year we ended up in a position where uh, after this conversation, we ended up only focused on the lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Some of you may also. Uh, without creating an administrative sergeant position. Um, but you're right. It does take somebody off the road because we put them in the office. Now that administrative sergeant is back on the road because we're short an officer again. And we, you know, Dennis had to make that choice. But that's, there is a loose connection there. It's probably more pronounced in my 
review when I do my transmittal because I directly use the phrase to avoid a reduction in on-road staffing. Mm -hmm. Add somebody in. But uh, one of the big things um, is freeing up those other three sergeants to do sergeant's duties. And I would take all administrative responsibilities away from them. Currently, I have two sergeants that share the training function. That would go away. The lieutenant would have that. I have a lieutenant or a sergeant that deals with the fleet. Um, the fleet is a never-ending process, whether it's oil change, repair. Currently, right now, we have three cars that are under a recall all brand new Ford products. They're all recalled. Uh, he's dealing with Ford and everything. That would be the lieutenant. The sergeants would no longer do those administrative duties. And that sergeant um, could be on the road more so than he or she is now. And that lieutenant would have all the duties. So they would have more time to be on the road and supervise or assist. And I think it's gonna be, would be much more efficient because all those lieutenants' duties would be handled by one person. When you split a function like training, sometimes things fall through the cracks. And if they're working the evening shift or midnights, how do you call the police academy and say, hey, what about this? Sure, you can send an email. But when you're emailing someone from the midnight shift, it's, it's kind of productive. It's kind of productive. So just... Humor me. Why would we have a police officer or sergeant managing the fleet? Couldn't an administ do we have admins? Yep. So we have two admins. One I would call as my executive secretary. I don't think I'll, I'll call her. She's a secretary that helps me out. And we have another person that does admin work in there. So Jen. She does all of purchasing for the officers and uniforms, whatever the case may be. Um, she does the purchasing for the department. She also does stuff for me. If I give her something to do or she types mails it up. Beth, who's the other person that works in the office, she primarily does our interaction with Collect, which is the state agency on how we run people. She does all the filing, they share the filing. She does redaction, we both do redaction. But more importantly, during the day, they answer the phones. So we have a regional dispatch center that does our dispatching, but the girls during business hours answer the phones. And we try to, you know, stagger their lunches, but they're allowed to take vacation time. So if one of the two is tied up, Jeff, in the new building, the system, the phones roll. Some days I spend a good portion of the time answering the phones. I shouldn't say a good portion of the time, but I can pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. Those two girls are very, very busy. Don't get me wrong. When we start stuffing the files, putting proofs in every year, it's all hands on deck. It's the two girls. It's me. It's hopefully the lieutenant. We're all going to be involved. So when Beth is doing cases, uh, either filing the ones that we don't have electronically, and she's going to know all the buzzwords for our file, she's going to say, oh, I do that. Walk over to the copier, scan it in, and put it in a folder for use. Um, they're not sitting around doing nothing. They're busy. Um, they do all the court paperwork that has to go to court. Um, they're, they're busy. They are busy. Jen also does all the permits. She does all the work on the pistol permits. Mm -hmm. And we do uh, roughly about 100 of those a year. She does the solicitor permits, the vendor permits. She does those. You know, so she's processed a, a lot of those things. Dealing with vendors trying to get closed, um, you know, with supply demands. I've had conversations with the town manager, you know, sometimes. We actually, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes it's just me and one of the other people down there and it gets busy, you know, and they can help some and they will help some, but it's not going to solve my problem. This accreditation is consuming. And sometimes a general order, because it affects so many standards, 
You literally have to open this book up, put that on one screen, look at the general order, put someone on another screen and go back and forth like you're a bobblehead trying to figure it out. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Sometimes general orders, you can take eight hours on one of them. It's, it's not an easy task. And I'm not trying to blow it up. You call any law enforcement agency that you know of and ask them about accreditation. And they're going to go, ugh. Uh, it's miserable. But is it going to get easier as we go on? Yes. You know, this first year, year and a half, it's going to be struggle. <laughs> it's going to be struggle. But we're hitting it. And as the town manager said, we had that administrative sergeant that did it. For six months, he was off the road. He did nothing but accreditation. Made a huge, better than huge, a serious debt in our goal to get there on August 8th of 2023. But now, you know, because we had someone retire, now we have some academy, we had to go back to the road, you know, and, and unfortunately, just to get it going, I have to pay him a little bit overtime every week just to keep the process rolling. But everyone is involved in it. It's not just him and I, it's his whole process. That answer your question? Mm -hmm. Should we talk capital? Sure. I, I don't. And actually, before we jump to the capital, I, I forwarded the revised capital plan last Friday. Right. So, did you did you all get it? The capital plan. I sent it out on Friday afternoon. Yes. Yeah. The revised. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we just we did. Okay, we'll have, um, well, it's smart now. Okay. Are there any, I don't think there are any changes in the, uh, are there any changes to the, in the revised to police? In police, no. 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 Okay, no, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have more question. So, so one thing I wanted to know, Who's in charge when you're not here? If you're on vacation or or what what have you? Is it a particular individual, or do you rotate it around amongst your sergeants? Or a coin? Okay. Um, a, I usually offer it up to the most senior person, mm -hmm. and then when I go on vacation, I give the town manager the initial point of contact mm -hmm. of the sergeant, but then I give them all the other sergeants' um, numbers. Uh, normally, to answer your question, it's usually the senior sergeant. Um, but it's a sergeant, you know, and we should. Uh, our particular senior sergeant right now, I don't want to comment with how much time they have on the, on the boards, roughly. Uh, 13 years? 13, okay. Um, and you mentioned about retirements and, you know, having to hire an employee. What, what is our average? As far as turnover and turbulence of rotation of personnel, either on an annual or it's not that much every two years, three years. So that's a very good question. So since I've been here, we've hired six brand new officers. So a little over four and a half years, we fired six officers. We promoted uh, two sergeants. We're in the promotional process actually right now uh, to promote, uh, to fill a vacancy created by one of the sergeants that just retired and went to the court bed. As I mentioned before, we have officer Picard that has stated he's going to retire in either, uh, November or December of this year. And then the following year, I have one officer that's eligible. And in the following year, I have one officer that's eligible to retire. And then I have a year off and then two people are eligible. So, just because they're eligible doesn't mean, to take doesn't mean no. they're going to take it. So fortunately, some of those are younger and they have children. Um, so the need to put them through college is probably going to keep them here a little longer. How often do we lose people to just other departments? Not, not that often. No one would be this department. Okay. <laughs> Good answer, I guess. Um, All right. The only I'm not saying they're smart because they did it. I'm just saying that we that. had since um, I can't remember. I can't remember even historically, where we've lost someone to another department. Just one with Middletown, I think. Okay. Bingo. Um, yes, but wasn't there talk about a layoff or something? So that person volunteered Good. to go to Middletown, so yeah. someone didn't get laid off. Mm. Um, I, I will tell you, one officer that we did hire did not make 
uh, probation did not, did not make his FTO process. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we, we had to, well, the town manager had to let him go. Well, sometimes you're better off letting them go early and eating that cost and keeping them on. And absolutely. Absolutely. With that, the general orders, I write general orders too. Unless you charge them. Yeah. Do <laughs> um, you have a, a mandate though on how often they have to be reviewed or is it just as needed? So some general orders, um, the standards require certain general orders to be reviewed either on an annual basis or a three-year basis. The, the, the ones that require annual basis are the, are the big ones. <clears throat> they're firearms, they're use of force, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're the big ones. The other ones, um, based upon the whole accreditation process, you're going to end up reviewing them every three years. Do our attorneys review those as well? Do a legal review of when these things have to happen? The attorney does not review them usually. Okay. So you guys do them and then? I do them. Then it goes to, go to the, the town, town manager. Town manager and town council. Yeah. Oh, and it's, and a lot of it is based on post guidance. Okay. A, a lot. Do they really? Yes. They come oh. back. Well, some, some of the general orders, um, as the town manager alluded to, are state mandated. Sure. So basically, um, for example, use of force. Just change the name because you have to meet this minimum standard at a minimum. So pretty much everybody adopts that. So like firearms, use of force, taser, um, pursuit um, are the four big ones that everyone basically just is not the policy. Um, but a lot of times with the standard will say, for example, we had a general that talks about securing prisoners. Um, it was a pretty good general order, but the post standard says it, you must search a cell for contraband, specifically culinary items. Our general order said you will search for contraband, but it didn't say culinary items. So it physically, that's how detailed they are. They want the word culinary. So um, I would say most of the changes that we make uh, are all pretty much standard based. We pay an attorney to generate these general orders uh, back in, I don't know, before me. So they were written by an attorney. Um, so there was some vetting back then. Regarding the body cameras and the car games and mm -hmm. stuff, so who's responsible for installing the, the equipment, the software, maintaining it, et cetera? So, yep, very good question. So we use Michael Scranton. Um, he has a place down on uh, Cinco Place. He installs the uh, equipment for us. So he's contracted to him. Correct. Um, when we went with uh, Axon, Axon body cameras and the Axon system, um, we paid a fee to have someone come in from Arizona and train him so he can he can do it, so he does it. So if an officer comes in, it's inoperable for whatever reason, who's being called Michael Scranton? Or no, me. Me or the, or the sergeant. To do whatever troubleshooting. Yeah. Okay. And, and most of the time um, is you press this button, this button, turn it off, turn it back on, and it clears itself. These things are very robust, very, very robust. Um, the cars, we've had some problems with motor connections. Um, but because we have a connection with Glastonbury and the way our information goes to Glastonbury, the two IT people, our IT per person, uh, IT person talk, and sometimes they come together. We have very few problems with these, thankfully. And regarding the information that's put up on the cloud, yep. Um, who can be authorized to? download and view that? Because you talk about it, it's got to be downloaded, reported, et cetera. Does it have to be an officer or can it be an administrator to that person? So the downloading <clears throat> um, of these devices are done automatically. So we have a bank of docking stations in the okay. station. You just drop it in there and it automatically offloads. The yeah, you're talking about pulling it yep. for a case. or So if court says they want a case, court is easy. 
that's the easy one. The easy one. Because if court, like if Middletown Court wants the body worn cameras, um, the court has been set up with the axon evidence.com site. Mm -hmm. So we could just share the link with them. So I can go in there relatively quickly within 10 or 15 minutes and give them all the cameras and they get an email link and they click on the link and it opens. It becomes more difficult if someone other than the, the court may want it, uh, like a different court that doesn't have it set up. It can take hours to download these body worn camera videos to thumb drives and they're huge, they're right. huge. Uh, and there was one last question. Who's authorized to do it? Could it be a civilian? Right. The answer to your question is it could be a civilian. Okay. So there's no state regulation that restricts it. Okay. No, no. Don't give them any ideas. Don't give them any ideas. Give them any ideas. ideas. It's not, you know, we've had these for a year and a half, you know, and, and you know, the, the manipulation of the software, I mean, it's it's not that difficult, but if you don't do it all the time, you know, you, you have to do it. Um, a certain way and we right now the admin accounts are assigned to the sergeants and me so if i was to have a civilian do it i would have to now pay for an additional admin accounts my last question is i'm looking at your budget and i'm looking at the line items of other departments maybe i'm missing it i don't see one for computer equipment laptops desktops whatever so monitors. there's a number in there for i think Three thousand. Am I missing it? Oh, I'm on the wrong page. I'm sorry. Okay, I see it. And, and we have uh, we have one copier in the entire police department, and we have one printer. Is that the same contract? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, two printers. We have one in booking, but it's back in the state system. I'm sure somewhere in the budget we get charged for that. Sorry, that's all. Any other questions? Be quiet now. Support the lift pad last year. Support the lift pad last year. Yeah, all of you did. All we all did. All of you did. Right. So yeah. you're all preaching to the choir in some way, right? But Uh, did you want to touch on capital? capital. No change. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a squad and an overhaul. Yes. Yeah. The, the cruiser conversion and then the uh, live stream fingerprint, I think. Uh, yeah. So the live stream fingerprint machine, um, just as a, a, a way of uh, comparison, um, the state um, Department of Public Safety replaced that. Uh, last year, um, the system is huge. It's probably this little smaller than this this board here. Um, it's where we do all the fingerprinting for the criminals. Um, it does palm prints, side prints. It does a photo, uh, and that was purchased by the state. And we maintain a a maintenance agreement for it, but it's it's very large. It's not movable. Unfortunately, sometimes when we have prisoners down there. Um, and we do fingerprinting on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Um, most of our fingerprinting is, uh, depending on the time of the year, is for people applying for teacher's positions. So when we schedule appointments, if we have a prisoner down there, we can't bring a civilian when there's a prisoner down there. So we have to reschedule the appointments. We do our best to accommodate them. Um, so what I'm looking for is a small amount of money to get a computer laptop-based system installed in a small interview room right off of the lobby of the town hall. Some people do not really like going downstairs and being in a cell block area being fingerprinted. Um, I don't blame them. It is very spacious, clean and nice, but um, this is designed so you bring them in the lobby, fingerprint them, have a nice day, much quicker. Never have to worry about if there's a, a prisoner down there. Um, again, it's computer-based um, with a scanner that's about this big, um, much less expensive than the big one. Um, we're not looking for 
any of the bells and whistles in, in that in that system to be the same. And then the cars, that's really it. The cars are a big price. This year we are going to try a uh, an overhaul of the car. Tim Fiegel, um, the manager actually came up with the idea. I met with Tim Fiegel when he worked at Belltown um, and said, what would it cost to do it? Um, the the re retrofitting of the car is for a brand new engine and a brand new transmission or brand new transmission or rebuild transmission. It's one of them that's flopped. One of them's rebuilt, one of them's, one of them's brand new. We're going to try that. We're going to try that if it gets approved on our nice, beautiful pink breast cancer awareness car. Um, it has the highest mileage, uh, but it looks the nicest. Uh, we're going to put a new engine in that and a new transmission, and we are going to watch how it performs and see if that system will work and potentially save us some money down the road. It's a fraction of the cost to buy a new vehicle. Hopefully it works. What's it's budgeted at 20, but we don't quite yet know exactly what that'll be because we don't know exactly what it'll be for the turnover, whether there's brakes will be involved or repaint or anything like that. The intent is to try to take a vehicle that we've had and loved for five or six years and start the clock over. And where is that in the budget? That's in the capital. There's 76,000 in the capital plan for cruiser cents. conversion. Uh -huh. One cruiser is 56 yeah. no, and 20 yeah. is in for the conversion. And I think eventually the chief will want to start talking about hybrids. He had planned to do a hybrid squad, and the capital committee decided not to do that yet. <clears throat> There's not really a lot of. Uh... Glastonbury is our neighbor, has hybrids that had no problem, but there's really, really no been multiple years to see how yeah. it's work. Mr. Fiegel had some concerns potentially about uh, the batteries and, and how they were going to do, but but I, I I like the hybrids because it saves gas, you know, and uh, when the cars park, it shuts off, you know, but it still maintains the, all the equipment. So just don't do electric. What's that? Don't do electric. Well, a lot of insurance companies are going to start denying. Really? Mm -hmm. Because of the batteries and the uh, fires. There's being a push by the federal and state government about moving their fleets to electric. Is that is, is there any trickle down effect where that's going to affect towns and municipalities? Lots of incentives, in right? Lots of incentives for that. Okay. Yeah. The incentives usually turn into numbers. Understood. Yeah. yeah. We have two officers that have electric vehicles. One of them, um, it was recently recalled and they were fortunate enough to replace all the batteries. So they basically just extended their car. I mean, they bought it when we were in the old town hall, so we've been here for three and a half years. So they just basically rolled their car over for, you know, yeah. to find the luxury. The batteries are very, very expensive. Yeah, and mm -hmm. between 10 and $15,000. Yeah. yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Yeah, Matt. Where are we jumping to? Yeah. Where do you want to start? Okay. Um, yeah, Matt, I'll just sure. introduce the secretary real quick. So uh, I'm Matt Walsh, I'm the public works director. Thank you for uh, having me here tonight. Um, so, uh, Largely, just as a general overview, I've pretty much kept uh, my budget as flat as possible, and I've made some cuts in other areas where I thought I could. 
um, Cemetery Care at Black Black. Um, you'll see on that sheet that nothing's been spent. Um, that's kind of my standard. I usually end up, because it's not a lot of money, I kind of save it waiting for trees to fall or things to happen over the year. And then I'll go do some like fencing or some maintenance items come spring, winter or summer. So it always gets spent because I always kind of wait because I never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of reason. I think I remember that from last year. Yeah. 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 Um, so really the, the, the two largest increases um, that I'll, I'll talk about and probably the easiest way to go through it is uh, we have a, an increase of the fuel uh, line item and that is about 6.2 percent and that is a ten thousand dollar increase you know and that's obviously due to the, the rising cost of fuel um and then the other you know significant one is the uh, rec use removal line item on the transfer station uh we've increased that by fifty seven thousand dollars um to one kind of try to take into account the unknowns of the current Closing because that was a picture we were saying our our trash uh, and um, also uh, the brush removal at the transfer station that's become uh, kind of a larger issue. Um, it used to be with uh, chipping the brush, people wanted the wood chips, so they would actually come do it for free. They would come with their tub grinder, grind up all our brush because they wanted the wood chips and they take it away. Then it got to the point where we had to rent the chipper and we could pay them and then they would still take the wood chips. But now you have to rent the chipper, uh, pay them to take the wood chips and it's just become a major issue down there. And I, I'm running out of room. So uh, this past fiscal year, I managed to get a contractor to just literally come and just pick up the brush and fall into Scott's turf over in um, Lebanon. And there they process it and turn it into mulch or whatever it goes into bags. So there was an increase in cost in that. Um, but it's it's a better long-term solution than, than trying to just have this mountain of wood chips that I can't get rid of. Um, but um, I was able to kind of offset that cost a little bit um, by $9,300 in the rental budget below because I don't longer have to pay to rent the tub driver to come in. So I was able to cut that. So uh, those are really the biggest things other than you know the, the contractual salary items um everything else i kept pretty flat you know made some cuts where i could so you know we got a head of parking mm -hmm. um with the transfer station you have um you didn't spend any money in 22 and this is on the building and equipment by 54 30. um the transfer station yep um okay yeah no money has been spent either in the prior year or currently is that kind of contingency or? yeah so basically i don't have you been down there it's basically yeah. a little shed mm -hmm. um that it, it does have power it has air conditioning um so things go wrong there but it's usually minor um but i have to have it there like, i have to have you know something for the guys you know when the right, the transfer right. station so I don't always spend it, um, but if something did happen that was catastrophic, like I had to buy an air conditioning system or the electricity, or, you know, who knows? Okay. I got to be able to fix it. So that's kind of why that's there, and it doesn't always get spent. There's there's not a lot there to spend it on, but when something does come, it might be some big expenses. Kind of the same with fifty six eleven in the transfer station. Um, there's a budget amount of 1200 but not really spent. Is that another? Right. So, you know, honestly, that's one that, you know, probably could get cut because a lot of our equipment we carry over from public works, right? So mm -hmm. we don't have our own set of doubles for the transfer station or things like that. Um, right. There's really not a lot of specialized items for there. Okay. So there's some potential for things up there. Underground maintenance, so. What grounds? Well, on the transfer station? Or the, no, no, no. Oh, the back on public That's works, where uh, we do all our tree removal comes out of there throughout town. Tree removal tree tree removal. comes. Yep. And I think actually I cut that out of here. Yeah. Can you? 
<laughs> I, thought, I had thought about it. Uh, let, me, let me just go back. You're at 50, Mark, Matt, and you spent about 55 in the last couple of years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, I would need that. It, basically, my thought with that is we're, we're gaining on the trees. So I think at some point we're going to be able to cut back because we've taken out so many of the dead ash trees, so many of the oaks from the caterpillars. So we're gaining on it. My, my, my call for dead trees have gone way down. So... I guess I decided to leave it flat. <laughs> what is your software no one's agreement for? Uh, auto okay. And okay. then we also have some other various softwares mm -hmm. to do the mechanics and rules. Mm -hmm. I think that's the largest. Jeff, what's the for motor fuel? Is there a general assumption of a rate that the different departments are assuming for the cost, or are they each figuring it out on their own? For fuel, we had just recently uh, locked in at 99 for diesel and 277 for gas plus applicable tax. Okay, so that's what's wrapped up in these numbers. Yeah. And we didn't lock in all the gallons too. We kind of hedged a little bit. So there's still some variable risk in that as well. Where's the staff traveling for $102? I believe that myself that I believe it, this hasn't happened since I've been here, but I think it's if my secretary has to take her car to go somewhere. Okay. Three person. It rarely person happens. Home. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's I, just weird that it's insane. Okay. Yep. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Made it look like there was more thought, but it's there. <laughs> okay. Nope. We have some new cases of the 107 or 50.90 other purchases. Yep. So, one of the things I did is, um, yeah, jump in here if I'm saying something. There's this line item up here on the town garage and in my admin budget. So, for some reason, they were trying to charge. I look at my whole facility in the town garage, right? And mm -hmm. it was somehow they were trying to say like the garage building is separate than me. So I, I, I don't need that. So okay. basically I'm just gonna charge that in my admin budget. I noticed in, these, in a lot of the budgets here, a line item for tech things. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Yeah. 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 It's leading me to think that we stand on for testing. <laughs> we, we, we have- So what is the story with all the tech things? We have uh, mice, we have crickets. We have um, well, they, they are around the corner. I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't. Maybe box them up and you know, you know, you know, eating you know, you know, them. Oh, eat them. <laughs> oh, yeah, they could eat them too. Yeah. Um, but we have. We do have some. Um, actually, I think that budget has gone down to the old town hall. We, we have a lot more in there for that. I think we have some certain side of that. So, but we do have. So, do we use all, through all the departments? Because I think Park and Rec have some pest control. Yeah. Do you oh, all yeah, use them to um, Is this an allocated yeah. amount to the, all these different departments? No, the individual. They would. Is it an same, same contract? Is it the yeah. same contract? Yeah. You know? I mean, I don't recall the same contract. I could like we use pest pros. I don't know if everybody else uses them. Yeah, it does sound familiar. Not too well. They do a good job. Yeah, I mean, the general government, they have to 250 bucks. I mean, it seems to be a, a widespread start. I can buy you some sticky traps. Yeah, <laughs> they have <that> money. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> they tried that at one point, and there's still some mm -hmm. random places. Like For that. the drywall. They that. do not have any mice stuck to them. Yeah. It looked like they tried sticky back. <laughs> I, think, I think part of the issue is, you know, because we are a place where there's always doors open, but the garage doors and, you know. Yeah, I think it's not, I can understand that, you know, but it's throughout all the departments. And right. yeah, that is sort of the question. Yeah. Lab rats to get up. I can't speak for them. <laughs> but I do know in our, in our facility, we, we do have. Jeff, can you quickly total just for the town? What the total pest control is for uh, actual expenditures, or I mean, um, I can look at I'm, I'm, just, I'm looking at 2023 right now. 
And it looks like where the town uses uh, test pros, and it looks like where it's pavement also uses test pros. So if I just kind of totaled up. The aggregation you gave me a while back, Jeff, shows um, in total all of the town's, the general, general operations budgets, uh, $3,400 for pest control. In total with the Board of Ed, the fiscal year that we're in 23 is about 11,000, it is 11,400. So the town, just the town is a 3,400? Yes. And the, and the Board, board of Ed, of how much? Uh, that total, I think they're probably about 8,000. For the four schools in the middle building? Yeah. Well, every one of them, doesn't every one of them have a kitchen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's your deal. I'm sure if it's, I'm sure that's part of it. The kitchens mm. and food regulations. Mm. Uh, droppage. Snack droppage. Mm. 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 Do you have any more questions for that? Yeah. Capital. Yeah, just capital. Oh, yeah. How are you doing with your road plan? Well, I've had to revise it a little bit. Um, oh, I think how the, uh, I mean, we've been doing it up to this point. I've been able to pretty much get done um, the stuff that is within the plan. I did deviate a little bit this past um, year because we had a couple of roads that just that past minute for some reason was very hard on a few roads in town. So, uh, like uh, Clark Hill, I hadn't really planned on doing that one just yet. So I had to go in and do Clark Hill and then Abbey Road was another one that we had some, some issues on. So I had to kind of tweak the plan a little bit based on that. Um, but just trying to think off the top of my head, it, Main Street was actually scheduled to be done, but we learned that we have a major drainage kind of issue there. So I've got to kind of put that off and kind of swap it home. But uh, as a whole, the, the plan's going well. Um, you know, I had initially, you know, planned it out based on, you know, the increase of 100000 um, in the capital budget every year. Um, I, see, I see that we're going to, you know, maintain at the current level. So I'll have to do some some adjusting there. And I know that there was some talk of potentially going up in the ribbons, um, which I think is a good idea, just how we implement that, and, you know, a discussion. Um, but yeah, the, the roads, I think we've been doing that. And the, uh, the plan has been a big help. It gives us a way to know where we're going so we can get in there ahead of time to do construction work mm -hmm. and prepare them for paving. I think it's been good. Uh, on Capitol, Long yeah. Hill, Long Hill uh, drainage. Tell me about that. Yes. Yeah, so because you've done a lot of work on there on this past. Yeah. <laughs> so what do I start? So Long Hill is, you know, I'm guessing that. One of the older areas in town. Um, the drainage system is severely undersized. Um, there's not really any drainage easements there for where the water dumps. The road itself is not an engineered road, so it kind of goes, you know, super elevates one way, super elevates the other way. Like the water doesn't really get to the catch basin the way it should. Um, and then on top of that, we have this old box culvert that's under the road and that ties into a pipe that goes under uh, somebody's garage and then out to a small brook that we don't have a drainage easement for, or don't appear to. Um, so there's just a whole host of issues there that really need to be engineered um, so we can get in there, fix those things, and then reduce the road. Yeah. Um, we went in this past fall and we did some shimming out there just because the road had gotten so bad, like it was beyond attaching cobbles. Like we had to go out there and actually put some asphalt down. It wasn't a lot, but enough to make it rideable and so we could buy it for the winter. So that's what you saw down in the last fall. And we also we also did Barton Hill and then um, Forest Street. Mm -hmm. Something like that. You're not requesting any vehicles? Uh, we are. We no. have, uh, we're requesting a uh, truck. Um, it's done. So. Sorry. Well, it's not technically. That so what far. you see okay. there is because this is where that gets a little bit kind of complicated because remember I said last night there's $1.4 million that's used to offset the capital, but <laughs> there's another 550 that's kind of off book. So if you look at the list of 
equipment replacement. Uh, I think that's either attachment three right, or attachment not from, four. Not from capital, right? It's it's ARPA money, ARPA, and it's eliminating an expense in that sinking fund, <clears throat> so the contribution for the sinking fund goes away. So the, right. the council or the committee basically said, let's spend three hundred thousand dollars and buy the sweeper and eliminate the hundred and ten thousand dollar contribution that would normally show in the capital fund. Following me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm playing a shell game with you right now. Oh, <laughs> And similarly, Matt asked for a two hundred and thirty thousand dollar replacement. That's one of the big six yard, six yard dump trucks. Uh, and similarly, that would be a reduction in their capital contribution. Yeah, didn't you last get a two We did. Yes, actually, that's gone well. So uh, the first truck we have back and is in service now. Um, it's worked out very well. We took for those of you that don't know, we took. Uh, Two fire tanker trucks that were being um, put out of service by the fire department. And they were up in my yard for auction. And I looked and like, these are the same chassis that we run in our dump trucks. I mean, they're older, but they only have like 20,000 miles on them. So uh, we, I talked to my mechanic and uh, he's like, yeah, we can do this. So we, we did it. Was, we did a lot in house. I remember when that was talked about. Yeah. Like, that's that, that terrific. Yeah, it worked out great. Savings. Yeah, uh, we were able to get the first one. I think it was about seventy thousand dollars total. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's what it was. Or for the body, we put a new body on it. Obviously, we had to have new hydraulics, the uh, sander mm -hmm. equipment, so the plow. Um, so that was done. It's in service. The second one, we're trying to do totally in house. Um, it's coming along. Um, they've got the the ready to put the body on. They're working now on the central hydraulics, but because it's our own staff, it's kind of like a a filler project, you know. You know they're not fixing other stuff which constantly breaks there and find the time right, right right which they've done well i mean i would say they're probably 70 percent done so my goal was to have it for march but it's probably not going to happen for this winter but it will I, I hate to say it will it should be done for next winter that's the plan so on this the sweeper are there companies that you can contract to do seasonal work it is very difficult yeah, find, and it's very expensive. Yeah, it's it's a lot of money. And then you know you're paying. Well, what's a, what's a lot of money? Uh, well, for instance, um, for our just our chip ceiling round, they're going to come and sweep for that, and uh, that's uh, thirteen thousand dollars for two days, probably three days worth of work. Okay, and that so but you wouldn't be spending to own a three hundred thousand dollar machine, right? House repair. Yeah. Benefit. So, also with that is yeah. we also use the sweeper. Yeah. You know, for one, we go out every year, right, and we sweep the entire town. Right. Which is, we probably we've already started, um, but we start, you know, usually March, and that goes almost till end of May. So, if you could imagine paying a contractor to do two hundred miles, because it's it, one hundred lanes are, you know, it's one hundred miles, two hundred yeah. lane miles road. It's, it's going to be significant. Secondly, whenever there's you know washouts, um, you know, random things that happen, storms, we send the sweeper out, right? So okay. um, it really is an essential piece of equipment. As much as it would be nice to, because that frees up staff to do other things, uh, it's really something. To do. And and then also the lake watershed, that gets swept definitely more than once a year. We're we're usually in there three times a year. Not. Anytime there's a big heavy rainfall, um, yeah. so it's it is crucial. And what I have done is, um, what we have now is a truck mounted sweeper. I've gone with the less expensive option of one of those three wheel uh, machines. It's not quite as fast to get around, but it's you know almost a hundred thousand dollars cheaper than what we have now. So, so Matt, you said thirteen thousand dollars. You thirteen thousand dollars for what twenty five years three hundred twenty five thousand dollars just wait if you, if you said I did to do thirteen thousand dollars every year I had to go contract out thirteen thousand well it's not for a year that's for three days that's what I'm saying oh, even okay. if it's all in yep you did that every year yeah twenty five years three hundred twenty five thousand dollars that's just that one three day right expense right you yeah. still have to ask the question yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we would try and and caution it. 
Yes, yep. Uh, I'm pretty sure anything that we've auctioned off. Right, of course, I think it's back at auction off goes back to the general fund and revenue. Okay. I do. I have a question, um, and it kind of goes into Parks and Rec. Under your page on 103, maintenance of village center, and then Park and Rec says maintenance of municipal properties in the village center. So Cranberry Bog, all the different areas. So do we have duplication? So... It, it's probably the way they describe it and the way I describe it is they, you know, park and rec are doing center school. Um, they are doing um, 94 main. 94 main, right. So they're doing things in the village, but what we're doing is we do all the mulching in the village. We do um, the sidewalks. We do those sort of things. You know, so we're both in the village center, but we're doing different operations. And uh, sometimes we actually do overlap and help each other out. You know, especially before old home days, things like that. Um, What's 84 main? 94 main. 94, 94. Board of that building. Um, yep. That's, that's another. That's <laughs> we haven't gotten rid of that. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't gone there yet. <laughs> Who's in there? I think it's the right. board of that I, I, remember, I, remember, I remember. And there's a learning they center. One of their programs. In there. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else with public works? Um, I don't, this might be better right up under um, Parks and Rec, maybe, but because uh, they do most of the grounds, is that right? Uh, it's it's kind of a joint operation. Depends on what it is. <laughs> so so it does. They do regular. They do the regular, you know, mowing type maintenance. Okay. And right. EPW come in for heavier things. Okay. Metal trim the trees. So one of the things that um, uh, has come up is um, if we could uh, figure out how much it would be to outsource that grounds maintenance and take it away from, you know, take it out of Parks and Rec's workload. And it would save equipment perhaps and um, manpower and is that possible to do that comparison? He has, I think, looked at it before. We can... I can have him pull that material. I I think it's something that things like that it should be done at least every every three or four years. Just go and look because you could have, you know, um, a decent landscaping company, but maybe they're having a really tough year with clients. And to get a municipality, you might get a very good deal, mm -hmm. and they may be able to do some of it a lot quicker. Sure. Yeah, that's entirely possible. And yeah. Keeping in mind that Park and Rec does. You know, field mowing and all of that as well. So they and they some of, they they farm out some of that, uh, the field uh, chemical maintenance and that right. kind of thing, right? Chemical maintenance. So, now, yeah, uh, we used to do more of that ourselves, but now mm -hmm. we don't have that staff anymore. So it'd be good to know. Yeah. Kind of. Anything else for public works? Thank you. All I'm right. gonna let them out of the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> There's food down the hall. Oh, thank you very much. I know I missed dinner probably. <laughs> have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. We did have an opportunity service at the community center. We didn't want to, didn't want to talk about it. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> he doesn't anymore. No. Not anymore. No. <laughs> So community center is 
of course, the library senior center facility. It's the costs associated with maintaining that building for those two. So the only real increase there is the cost of the staff person that manages or that handles that building. Other costs are either flat or dropping, frankly. We, we're benefiting, we continue to benefit from uh, the solar farm that we have an agreement and an arrangement with over on Skinner. Uh, we get the we get two million, the total of the town overall gets two million kilowatt hours of uh, electricity every year from that facility. And it gets divided among 10 of our accounts. Right. Half of them are basically four of them are Board of Education accounts and WPCA and the other five are on the town side. So one of them is this. So those lines, when did that start? 21? Uh, we have 20 March, I think 21, yeah, March. we started getting energy from there. So we've had about 20, well, when we did the math, we had about 20 months of experience and, and the general fund for the town, we saved about 170,000. And they've been, that savings been spread over the, those uh, lines for the board of bed, blah, 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 blah. Right, okay. right. So you, we started to see that we, we sort of hedged our bets a little bit in the, in the current fiscal year budget. And now we know have, we have now more data and you'll see some more either flatlining or reductions in the electricity side. And, and the credit, when we first signed the contract, they, they front end loaded, they had a pretty heavy credit for us that then got reduced in year two, then they got reduced again in year three. So it was more advantageous. There's more of a, more of savings packed into the, the first 36 months. And then it's gonna kind of be kind of be flat those savings. So I think year one, it was estimated um, close to $90,000 for each contract. And then it went down to around 57. And then when it levels out, it's gonna be about 33,000 savings per, per contract. So the town contract and the board of ed contract, we should probably see overall $33,000 a year in savings. Each. Each, yeah. Is the library roof still watertight? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. So the, the full-time salary there, that's a, someone who maintains that whole building? Mm -hmm. Does cleaning, does maintenance, <clears throat> light and medium maintenance, I'll call it. So that might be filter changes, that could be minor maintenance, cleaning on HVAC, RTU, you know, those units, as well as the indoor daily cleaning and all those activities. And um, shoveling. Yep, outdoor shoveling during the during the winter. Um, they handle that particular individual uh, when we get into plowing mode or when we get into storm cleanup mode, that particular individual uh, handles plowing of the parking lots at the town facilities. Mm -hmm. okay. The two of them, that is the individual that does this building and the individual does that building combine and do the small maintenance activities and the cleaning activities at DPW and some other work at the fire stations as necessary. So they basically work with the facilities director and handle mm -hmm. those, but mostly divided into the two buildings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Related uh, Capital there, I see the capital tail is sticking oh, yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably the most significant uh, is uh, a conversation about the siding uh, at the library senior center. Uh, you'll, you'll recall last year we had a conversation about uh, a repair and painting job. Uh, when the facility director got into that job this year, uh, it was much more significant in terms of wood loss and whatnot uh, at that building. And we anticipated some a pretty routine activity of going back and having to paint that. So there was a conversation had with the, uh, uh, with the capital committee and the recommendation is to uh, use the 80,000 we put in there last year and add another $170,000 and do a 
a vinyl siding product on that on that building and be mm -hmm. done. Yeah, actually, I'm trying to remember those times. So the front will, the front, I'll call it two sides or two and a half sides, whatever it is, will mimic. You know that that's the cedar shake. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was another problem. He couldn't get new cedar shake of the yeah, same, thick, yeah. same thickness. So anyway, uh, it would it would mimic that cedar shake look. And then on the back, it would be just standard yeah. siding. And, and that, that imitation, I call it, really does look pretty good. I've seen a couple of homes with it. Mm -hmm. So that's the proposal there. Uh, that's the biggest one, I think, over at the, yeah. at the community center. Yeah. All right. Uh, or we can just kind of slide down more if you want to sit right next to Dave. Okay. Slide your chair up. Or, or there. I didn't see a spot. Maybe maybe you know. What? We'll have dead tension. <laughs> So my name is Lauren Incognito. I'm the director of social services and youth services. Um, so this year, the only um, the only increases we'll see are under salaries and benefits. Uh, no other increase in any other line item, um, except for those two. So if you have any questions about the department, I'll be the enhancement to grant. Yes. How much do you have left this year? Is it uh, a recurring grant? Uh, I see a lot of programs are covered by your enhancement grant there. So um, tell us about that. It, it, it is a recurring grant and we have yeah. to apply for it every year. Um, I believe, um, I'm sorry, I don't have this off the top of my head. I believe there's about 5,700 perhaps left um, that we have to use for programming. Um, and some of the things that we're thinking about are possibly bringing in some speakers. Um, we're having uh, an event here on April 11th for the young uh, for the kids uh, ages like seven through 11, seven through 12. So we'll use funds from that enhancement grant um, that'll pay for that program. I'm also working on something uh, with Christina Amaral, and hopefully, if we can get that finalized, some of the funds from the enhancement grant will be used for that as well. Um, but it is it is uh, a you know yearly grant that we you know that we apply for and that we're funded with, and that's uh, what's the total of the grant on an annual basis? I'm sure. If we get um, like what Jeff like eighty six hundred around there. Yeah, this this year looks like we received over almost twelve thousand. Because we had the supplemental. Uh, that's right. We had yeah. some supplemental funds. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Forty-seven hundred. Well, okay. How much is that? Forty-seven hundred. Staff-wise, in that department, uh, you have one full-time employee, Lauren, paid out of the general fund. You have one full-time employee, uh, Courtney, who is paid entirely out of a grant, uh, the the uh, drug and alcohol prevention grant that we receive, and then they have a. a part-time administrative person uh, and essentially caseworker uh, in that department that's paid part-time and then another part-time, there's several part-time people that are paid out of the grant for various activities there. Um, on the, um, the line item 544, for the direct assistant, is that a timing? Um, because you have 14,000 in, but year to date, roughly 2,600. So I was thinking, because I see you spent that decent amount. 
in the last budget. Yeah, so for this fiscal year so far, we've spent about uh, $4,880 uh, of that. Um, so we have approximately a little over 9,000 left. So the majority of the expenses in that line item are going towards eviction costs, um, moving and storage um, that the department pays for. We also had two other larger direct assistance um, funds. We had a, an elderly gentleman in town who was without uh, heart medication um, and diabetes medication. So uh, we paid for a 30 day script. His insurance was gonna kick in on uh, February 1st. Um, and in that time he was going, you know, close to three weeks without medication. So to avoid obviously something yeah. catastrophic, the department paid uh, $776 for those medications until his insurance uh, kicked in. We also had a woman um, who we helped. Um, she works full time, um, is, is a renter in town, has a stable job, but life happens, something came up and she couldn't make her rent uh, just for that one, that one month. It was very situational. So the department used its direct assistance upon the direct assistance funds or rather to um, pay five hundred dollars um, for her to be able to cover that month. But the majority of our expenses, that's what that's where they're going to. They're going to the uh, costs associated with um, evictions. OK, so I'm just looking at this, this twenty six hundred. You just haven't really had that much in this current budget year. Right, that figure basically swings wildly. Okay. Uh, we can have instances where, uh, if there's a town, if there's a town action or a regulatory action that causes someone to be out, the town ends up paying through this direct okay. assistance fund to relocate somebody. That's why you see a very large number from prior, last year, right? Uh, where we had a scenario that. It was technically a town action, but it was really because there was a problem at the house and we it was declared uninhabitable. And we're still working with the landlord to get paid back for that. But that's it's those kinds of things where the, there's a an unpredictability to them. Uh, we've been fortunate that we haven't had a lot of that again with the knock this year thus far. Operation fuel. Um, you say you do not deal with a lot of applications. Is it people don't know about it, or no? They 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 know about it. And are you are you asking in terms of our you know if whether we pay for for fuel for people? No, with that we typically will send folks to either the, the food bank. So unless it's a situation where. Um, the food bank is closed or, you know, they need something right away or they need the funds to pay. I think we had to help a woman who needed the funds to pay off a bill before she could get a delivery. Okay. But no, Christine um, Wiesner, who is our case manager, she processes, you know, all of those applications. Okay. So yeah, no, the community does know about it. And, it's, and interestingly, what's happening is we're actually starting to get people from Marlboro and are having to tell them that they need to utilize services in their town but um so people definitely know about the programs it's that particular one that doesn't get a lot of use through our correct any else questions thank you okay have a good evening everyone you too. Thank you. Thank you. I had talked to it long earlier today about the overlap between mental health services between the uh, schools and the social services offices there. And um, they really are complementary to each other and really is no significant overlap or yeah. anything to do there. Jeremy's just tied up in another meeting. Uh, Middle Haddam Library, <clears throat> she had to go down to Florida. She was scheduled for Saturday, so she's coming out of town around. She'll be here on Saturday. We haven't really talked about street lighting. It's <laughs> <laughs> you should say the best glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's flat. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we 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 uh, we did keep that uh, keep that allowed. Yeah, that's one of the accounts. That's one of the accounts. Accounts. Yeah, so the accounts that are are count by the county. The schools have all four schools are on their contract. Our contract is town hall, library, community center, street lights. Uh, one of the pumps for the weight aerator. They use a lot of electricity. And then the WPCA, uh, their facility. So uh, natural gas um, prices right now are really low. Um, is it uh, just not prudent to uh, cut those lines at all? Because um, Line. Yeah, you know, it was it was high, now it's low because of supply. Yeah. Um, but it, the prices are the same or more <laughs> in the budget. Yeah, we we did um, we made adjustments where we felt that the, the budget was not adequate to, to cover what we're currently paying. We don't have a program right now where we can lock in we've been talking to one one vendor who's requested all of our bills from cng so we're waiting for a follow-up to see if, uh, if there are any opportunities for us to lock in on natural gas all through next year because it is the price is low right now right uh because of the mild winter i yeah i think it is Lower than what it has, than yes, what it has yes, had. but we don't have uh, a vehicle for which we can lock in right now for that. A vehicle, okay, meaning a, a way to contract with somebody for a set oh. price, mm -hmm. yeah. And the board of ed, I believe they removed all the oil tanks, so it's not as if they could switch back, back and forth, mm -hmm. kind of tied into these kind of gas. On the town side, we have overall a, a 6% increase in the natural gas budgets. So 3,600 overall for the town side. Is so so I don't understand. So how do, how do you figure that? How do I, how did the, you figure? Yeah, the, a 6% increase when the bottoms dropped out of the market. Well, again, when we were doing the budget, as Jeff said, we were looking at areas where we had expenditures and had to make predictions, but you know, so this was when we started this activity in you know January, in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some fudge there, but you have to look now. You don't know what's in the happen. future. Yeah. Well, the other thing to be cognizant of is when you're looking at whether it's Arbot gas, natural gas, a lot of times they're showing what today's prices for March contract or April contract, right? It's those may be lower. So when you say natural gas has gone down, has natural gas futures gone down for November through February? So that you have to kind of look at that as well. Because when people say, you know, they're showing gas and what it's trading at, it's where it's currently trading at those contracts. They don't show what it's trading at because every month there's future contracts. <laughs> they don't necessarily show you those. So, and I suspect those, those months that are, out in the winter months are probably trading higher. Okay. Be more yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I apologize for running out during Chatham. That was Mark Philhauer on the phone, and I've been trying to catch him today. So mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if there were any questions when I turned my back and walked out on you. <laughs> I, so. I apologize for Just that. talked about you. I'm sure, you know, that was the opportunity. <laughs> so it's just waiting on Jeremy? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Can I ask a question about where the insurance, the is it uh, medical insurance or is it health insurance? How's that term? Where has it ended up, the, the increase this year? It the was going to be increase was 7.1. 7.1. And is this, is that what is budgeted for in this book? Yes. Okay. Yes. We, we actually knew that 
on time this year. Right. 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 The last year, right. Five, 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 six, seven, so I'm wondering about the board of ed if this. Mm -hmm. uh, we all knew the number. They have a different, slightly different number, I thought. Or maybe they have the seven one. Two, no, I don't think they use the seven. They originally good. projected twelve in their yeah. budget presentation because they didn't know at the particular right. time. So they have adjusted that number to seven point one. But then they put the they money somewhere the money else. Elsewhere. They were like, no, I can put it somewhere else. And, and I have they, the, and they use the money how yeah, I have, I have yeah. the slide. I can from that night to the screen. Well, he looks that up. How about the um life insurance? Have you seen a big increase in that? In the premiums for that? Yeah. I don't think so. Because you know, not that we're here on the Board of Ed, but if I'm not mistaken, the Board of Ed had a 19% increase mm. in their life insurance. So the medical life insurance, insurance was, actually for the town went down. But I, I don't know if that's utilization or what. But. So two numbers they originally predicted was the medical insurance at 12% and the pension at 10 and a half. And they came in lower for, for a, about a total of 139. And so what Paul Smith briefed was he'd like to put that money into classified salaries and special education tuition. Not necessarily that he's um, allocating that immediately, but the just in case, because of kind of what they went through this year, I guess, with the special ed where the costs went up and, and in the briefing and I got the time stamp if you want, because I was at the meeting he said, and I'm for the board of finance member here, I promise that if I don't need it, I won't spend it. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so I what remember that. Sorry, I didn't remember that. Right. <laughs> Why? So he's saying it's a savings. He doesn't want to give it up, but maybe we make him give it up. I don't know. Sorry, we're and how much? Did you, how much did you say? One hundred thirty-nine total between the two. One hundred thirty-nine thousand. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I just bought a month's um, CME group which has the futures. April twenty twenty-four natural gas is forty percent higher than April twenty twenty-three. <clears throat> but yes, April twenty twenty-three went down. But again, when you see those numbers, you got to look at what are the, the future contracts going for. In April, it's just about 40% higher. All right. Forget that idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thought. <laughs> I, I, I hope we get lucky and it, and it goes down and you know, we over budgeted for right. it. Right. I'd rather be on that side of it than the other side coming back and asking for money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, their life insurance um, board of ed has it uh, nine, uh, call it a twenty percent increase in life insurance. Twenty mm -hmm. percent increase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right here. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked about your life insurance because I did see that it went down. So, so well, we have a low, 94 Main Street, which is something I'm not following. So Ford of Ed has personnel in it. So who, who actually is budgeted for them for taking care of that building, paying for that building? Is it Board of Ed money or is it for, it's Board of Ed money? Other than outside maintenance. Other than what we just got briefed on, right? Is that covers the storage garage right behind it also? Or is it just the building? In terms of what the Board of Ed pays for? Yes. Uh, I don't know that uh, <laughs> we, it's we own that, but I, I don't know that there's an expense we own it. there. The I, town, the town it's not it. distinct. It might have electricity in it, so it's not distinct from the building. They well, handle they that. And I know they store things in there, as do we. Okay. We say what? They're, in a sense, they're really, you know, they're really not renting it. We're paying for it. If we own the building outright, if they don't own it, how can it just it, they don't they don't have revenue to pay rent? No, they don't have, yeah. So the state does this all the time. It, it boggles my mind that one department charges another department rent. So so for example, in our armory, we also have the, the office of emergency management. So when you see the governor during storms, that's where he is, and they've got the big screens and stuff. And we charge them rent 
but it's one state agency paying another state agency. It's the same tax dollars in the that shell game. It, it is. <laughs> it is. It's basically one agency transferring the money to another for us to maintain the building, et cetera, et cetera. We're just to keep it to begin with. It's because it's the same pot of It's money. an accounting issue. I it is an accounting yeah. thing. Right? Right. Yes. You can show the cost of emergency management, for example. Right. And right. housing them and everything associated with this stuff, too. Well, I tell you, it would be really easy if you could just kind of lump it all together at times, yeah. right? Right. And then, of course, we'd start to say, well, how much does it really cost over here? And we'd start to scroll back the other way. And... <laughs> <laughs> but for, for like that particular the, the building that IT is in, Personally, this thing needs to be sold. It really does. Somebody paying taxes. So how long is yeah, that group to be in there? That's a, that's a community decision. It's, <laughs> it's a community decision. You know, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I thought originally it was going to be sold. Yeah, it was supposed to be. And I think there is a blend of remembrance in that. There is a blend of recollection among the community on that. Yeah. There was That's the best I can say, it, but it wasn't part of that referendum where it had to happen, right? It, it's it was supposed to be all yes was going to go, but right? And it was supposed other, to be sold. The other enclaves, because it wasn't just named for me. It was, yeah. Now, what's the others. other group that's in there? There's the IT people, and then what program is in there? The learn. It's the um, adult learning center. Is that what it means, or? Is that the one under the board of ed? I think they're probably Asian. They were getting like some money for the first year and that would cover it. Why do I remember something like that? We have the book. Come on, Matt. Oh, yeah, down yeah, there. So. Heads in the seat. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Sorry, I, I thought I was scheduled for 6.30, so. You probably oh, apologize. I'm a little late. This came from a sports meeting at the high school. <laughs> Always something, right? All right. How's everyone? Good. Great. Am I the last one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that's right. We just yeah. cut your budget for nothing. Yeah. You know, I guess you can do it in an hour. So, um, I hope you weren't waiting too long then. You know, you don't pay Jim on yet? 111. All right, so I'll just kind of jump in with what's been going on in my world, in the park and rec world, over the course of the last year. Uh, one of the biggest change of events for me in my department was, well, we had two, but one of the biggest ones, uh, right after the, the last year's uh, sort of budget approval referendum, I lost one of my park maintainers, actually two of them, but... Um, and both of them have been with the department for quite a while. One had been there for well over 11 years, um, and one had been there for about five years. The loss to that uh, one park maintainer that had been there for over 10 years uh, was really significant. Uh, he had all his um, certifications for pesticide management, um, CPSI, which is a playground safety inspection certification, um, those things that we could do in-house that really didn't cost a lot of extra money for us to go out there and outsource that to a contractor. So what that really did for us, and you'll see it in the budget request this year, is it sort of inflated the um, the cost of the grounds and maintenance budget. To outsource a company to sort of contract the pesticide management and turf uh, management up at the high school is about a $25,000 a year cost. Um, to have a company come in and do that. You need to have somebody that's certified in that. While we were under the uh, direction of the uh, park maintainer who was here prior to him leaving, uh, we were able to kind of sneak, sneak those costs through at about five to 7,000, which was really the application just for, um, for grass seed. Um, so there was a big increase there. Um, so if you look at this year's budget, there's still time to go through the next fiscal year. Uh, we've exhausted that account. If you look at the current standing of that account, we're about $2,000 shy of that. But um, we try to save around $10,000 going into this spring season uh, for grounds and maintenance costs. Those are you know, different things like blades for the mowers, uh, any maintenance repair projects, and, and our first round of uh, you know uh, supplies and equipment and things of that nature. So 
that was our first big uh, sort of hiccup coming into this fiscal this this fiscal year that we're now. Which slide item are you talking? I'm sorry. Which that's the grounds grounds and maintenance line item. Five four uh, three one. Yep, and that's the increase of a thousand dollars. One of the things you'll see in here is I did ask for a little bit more. Talking with the town manager, it looks like our capital request for top dressing. Um, the fields at the high school will be in there as a capital request item this year. So we backed out the additional money that I had I was asking for uh, to bring us up to um, standard to be able to pay for the, the grounds and maintenance um, of the day-to-day -day use of the high schools and um, you know the, the top dressing and all that really stuff. So that's why you see a thousand dollar increase rather than an eight thousand dollar increase. All right. Um, one of the other things that I, I want to talk about a little bit this year that we've done really well with, and I'm sure there's going to be questions about this as we move along, um, is this year, actually it wasn't the start of this fiscal year, but we did add the, the new um, program um, manager to the account, um, and that's been, if anybody follows Park and Rec on Facebook or any of the programs that we offer, you'll see that that's been booming for us. Um, there's sort of that need and that want, but we did finish our needs analysis this year, this past year, um, that really sort of populated the uh, sort of a poll in the town. Was part of the survey because it was just a part of it. Yeah, I had a problem with that survey. Filling it out, or well, I I was able to take it sixteen times. Yeah, it so been one of the first ones then. So. Is how did you come around the data then to correct to correct that? Did we? So it's a it's a good question. Um, really, the real way and the better way to do any type of survey is to put it out to the public in a mailer, right? Um, we were sort of up against the funds there that to to do a mailer and an actual an accurate survey, you want to get it out to as many people as you can in the public, um, and you do that by mailings and things like the online surveys. We didn't have the funds to be able to do that. Uh, I believe it was cut out of the town council and cut that for us. So we didn't have that in the capital fund last year. So we had to use funds from the special revenue to offset that. The next best thing is a survey through Survey Monkey or another distributing company that such as Survey Monkey. So when you do a survey like that, it is nice to put it out to multiple people within a household. And some people like to fill out an online survey through Survey Monkey through the same computer just a different person in the family might be doing. Well, so at first we opened it for that purpose. Um, it was quickly found out that we were doing that. And within about three weeks, the town council said, we need to streamline that better. We don't want multiple people being able to take it, that survey from the same device. So really what it did now is it five people in a household and they are all able to vote or cast a survey, now it really only allowed one person to complete that survey from a computer. Because it's really just a business rule when you set up and survey monkey, because I do surveys all day long mm -hmm. um, for our com my company. Mm -hmm. And the question around surveys generally is the data, we only keep data for six months. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have a plan, an ongoing roadmap to we do so? The needs analysis is the first start to a master plan. The idea would be that we we wanted to get the entire master plan, as I indicated before, funded last year, but it was another $25,000 for a company to come in and do a, a total master plan, which is still our vision. We wanna go in that direction and we're trying to work toward that right now, but we've only completed a needs analysis that gives us an understanding of what the public upfront is looking for. Might not be the total package, but at least it gives us a roadmap to where people want to go. So it doesn't we build, just mean financial stuff. Okay, I'm sorry to bother yep. to interrupt, but so we you took the information from the original survey last year mm -hmm. and created these new programs. You're correct. A start to the roadmap. <laughs> okay. So now on the new programs that you have, can you provide to us the individual programs? The cost, the the cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Have we made money? Uh, how many people participated? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I could, if I shared with you everything we've done, you guys would be looking at a list of, you know, upwards of two hundred and something programs. Okay. But I can send, I can give you a snapshot of what it looked like for the the current month that we're in now, which is only three weeks in. And I'd like to see 
all the, you have here, um, can you, the programs that you've offered, mm -hmm. the additional new programs, because I do follow you on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, a listing of those programs, how many people participated, what was the cost, how much did it cost us to pro provide that program? Did we make any money? Absolutely. So for every program that we do, we do a break-even analysis yes. first. That will give us an idea of how much we need to make, how many, how much, how many registrations we need to bring in to make enough money to run the program. And then once we we've got that, we go ahead and run the program, which honestly, about 99% of our programs that are out there right now run. Which means there's not a, there's a there's a need and a want from the public to bring that in. So after we do the break even analysis, we review it, we put the program out, we do a cost analysis. So we'll take all of our costs, our salaries, our material costs, and we bring that all together. That we burst the expenses, revenue, and then we come up with an ROI. So we have it all broken down in Excel spreadsheets. I didn't bring those, but I can certainly provide that to you guys as email format if you'd like. Yeah. There's a lot of programs, so I would flood your email with a ton of cost or break-even analysis and um, cost analysis, but I can certainly provide you with a breakdown of every single program in a smaller format where it just says revenue uh, versus expenditures if you want, however you want, and I can do it. And we have it all. I have it in a, in a binder in my office, right? Excuse now. me, your, your special revenue fund has what, $230,000 in it or so? Yeah, that, that's pretty good. It's 231000 actually. Yes. <laughs> <on that disc. laughs> that's that's right. ninety-six. Yes, yeah, so you have the exact number. Of <laughs> yeah. So that, that special revenue account holds. Um, right now, we I did some breakdowns in comparison of where we were, where we are now compared to where we were last year at this time. And my numbers have indicated that we really are about 24% um, increase on our expenditures from last year at this time and a 21% increase on our revenue numbers from where we were last year at this time. All right. I think that this is definitely going to be our busiest month leading into the summer months because we have all our summer programs out there and we're currently taking all the registrations for that. One thing to keep in mind that we will exhaust about 60% of that budget going through the summer months because most of the revenue that we take in now doesn't get expensed until July, June, July, August of this summer. That's where most of our expenses come from. I'll give you a round a ballpark figure here. Last year, we made we did about seventy thousand dollars in revenue from our Sears Park program, which is an eight week program in the summer. We paid out in just salaries alone thirty two thousand in just salaries and and some material costs in there. So, I mean, you can kind of get an understanding of what we're dealing with and how we we program to that. This year, we didn't increase our costs astronomically um, for participation in that program. And we're going to be seeing an increase in minimum wage go up to $15 an hour this year. Our point, our mission within the department is to keep our costs as low as possible while being self-sustaining as much as possible. So if you look at our camp staff, they all come out of our special revenue account. Um, if you look at our lifeguards when they run um, swim lessons, they all come out of our special revenue account. So that doesn't, that's not, the lifeguards are not included with the summer programming that I talked about. Do you have any plans for the balance of the special revenue fund as far as you know, physical improvements? Or... Yeah, uh, I know I, I, I sat here last year talking about starting to become a little bit more self-sustaining out of there and lowering our tax base. I still have a plan to do that. Um, you know, we have Sean, our my, my, uh, program coordinator, 15% of his salary comes out of there every year. Um, I, I'm trying to make it operational and this first four months of having a full-time program lead has shown that we've been successful so far. And I want to continue to build on that so that we can keep a balance in there where we can start using funds for a dog park, uh, which is in the talks. I know the pickleball thing is um, going through the ARPA funds this year, but you know there's opportunities to do things like that in the town and bring opportunities. So why, why what are you thinking about a dog park? Uh, we're working with Edgewater, or Edgewater here to okay. possibly build one up out in front of town hall. These are just preliminary. There's no solid plans in place. We haven't even gone down that road. But when we do look at it, and this is something you guys should be aware of, when we look at open space opportunities in this town, there's not a ton of space within nearby developments. If there is, it's conservation land, right? It's not It's something you really can't build or develop on. Um, so, you know, one thing that we try to look at is finding the open space where there are neighborhoods, 
where you can bring opportunities for people to recreate within their neighborhoods. And I think Edgewater is going to pro provide that opportunity for us. Um, you know, these types of neighborhoods like Skyline that wants access to Sears Park with sidewalks. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to help bridge that gap or connect to Airline Trail from, you know, Royal Oaks neighborhood or, you know, those other big developments that give people passive recreation and opportunities to do that. So trails are a big part of what we want to do once we complete the Airline Trail, uh, which is going to hopefully be in the works next year. So or this year. So um, I do have plans to use that and give that back to the public. The idea of that fund is to use it in a way that, you know, we give back because we've taken it with fees, we can give back to the public in those types of ways. And again, everything I've listed are ideas and thoughts. Once we get to that phase of coordinating those efforts, we'll set up subcommittees within the Park and Rec Board, and we'll talk about how to make those into a fruition, into what we really want it to be. So if you're not a fan of a dog park or a pickleball court, these are just thoughts. There are ideas that are generated from essentially a needs analysis that the public would like to do. So that came in from the survey, the dog park, and yeah, it was it was a top priority. I mean, honestly, some of the other priorities were um, a pool, you know, um, yeah. indoor facility. So let's be realistic here. I know what we're dealing with. Um, I've been doing this for nine years. Trust me, I'm not out here pitching a pool to you guys for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there's opportunities for lower cost recreation opportunities in this town that can be funded through a special rate. <laughs> We're just fortunate that we have ARPA funding right now and we're able to use it for things like, you know, pickleball courts and redoing our tennis courts at, at Sears Park. That's great, right? But there's opportunities to do things at $50,000 coming out of that special revenue account where we're now seeing that we're going to be self-sustaining soon enough, right? Maybe not 100%. I know my salary will never fully come out of there. I know Sean's salary will never fully come out of there. That's my program coordinator. But we have opportunities to do things that we can get back to the public. And I think that's the long-winded version of you know what I see in my department. How I yeah. One of the things we uh, talked about with Dave earlier today um, was to see if the uh, uh, maintenance of the um, grounds around town, mm -hmm. the uh, schools, uh, would it be advantageous to outsource those? To who? To so, a landscape company. So have a landscape company come in and mow and do, do all this do stuff. All yeah, the everything. Yeah. Have you looked into that? Um, um, we do. Analysis? We do actually use a uh, private contractor to do some of that stuff for us. So like the hillside here, because it, it is tough to get, um, you know, two guys doing this stuff in the fall is difficult. Um, I know you would spend a lot more to outsource it than you would on the salaries of the, my staff that are doing this work. Well, it's not just salaries, it's, it's the, the equipment, equipment and everything that goes into it. Yeah, well, the equipment we have is already there. Yeah, but you have to maintain it. Of and course. There's no scag mower, mower in this year. Yeah. Program. Yeah, I, I would, um, I've looked into it in a, in a long, uh, you know, I've gotten quotes from companies to do work like this, and a lot of them do want the big project. I mean, you're talking well over $100,000 a year, and just, you know, them coming out for six months out of the year to maintain these grounds. Jeremy, what I said to the to the board was that we would uh, we would look at what we have done in the past and uh, commit to updating that periodically to, right. to see how well it balances out for us, whether there's a way to be can do it for less. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of it. I'll come out and say that to you guys. In the <laughs> I've been doing this for long enough to know that you're going to get what you get from a, a company that comes in and, and mows your fields. Um, you know, one of the toughest things that I found is when you're dealing with a contractor, such as an outsource company, you're going to you're going to deal with them on their time, right? They're going to if you need somebody to come out and quickly mow a field when but they can't get to it for three days and you have a baseball game on that field. Mm -hmm. How are you going to manage that? You know, they have other clients. They might not be the top priority. Well, we're not saying that it would absolutely be the best solution, but it is. I honestly believe in when I was working on a regular basis, we looked at things like that. Yes. Um, because we had to justify why we're keeping our staff. So I think that's really the where we're going with, you know, let's see if we can out if there's things we can outsource cheaper um, because we're maintaining equipment while well, we're buying equipment, maintaining equipment, finding a place to store it. And then of course you do have staff. And then on top of just their hourly, you've got all the medical benefits, you've got everything that goes with it. And additionally, 
a lot of the staff in town, um, because it's in a union type contract, um, they're not at will employees. So you got a problem child, you can't, <laughs> you gotta go through a lot yeah. for that problem child. And if you, if, if that was a decision that was made, you would still, I guess, look for me to manage that whole thing, correct? As a park and rec director? It because could be something that ends up in public, public works. works. Okay. It yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I, again, I, I think you're, you get your hands full with that. If you make a decision based purely on finances, um, you well, know, it makes sense, but I, I honestly just don't, I don't think it would be the best benefit of the town if you're doing something like that. That's my own opinion. Okay. So, I've been doing it long enough to know that you're going to deal with your headaches and then not, you know, doing the job the way you want it to be done and on a timely manner. Um, now back to your um, your your fund here. Um, you had talked about the self-sustaining, the sustaining. Um, talked about the pickleball court, but I saw in capital there's dollars for pickleball court. Is there a reason it's maybe not coming out of this fund? <laughs> The pickleball courts, I, from what I've been told, is coming out of the ARPA funding. Is that correct, Dave? Yeah, um, simply because of the size. I think you really are talking about constructing a new court or replacing something that's existing. Yeah, I think it's what, so, 50,000? Uh, so putting it in, that's why it's in the capital. Yeah. It was there last year, too, but it didn't make it through. Mm -hmm. the, it made it through the Board of Finance, but it didn't make it through the town. Okay, so the goal is to use the ARPA fund, but let's go... Some other court wants to be created. Our money is all gone. Is that what this is good for? I'm sorry. Is because this the special it, revenue program? Yeah, the special when it revenue comes the, um, culture and recreation. Um, because when it goes into the capital, the, the taxpayers granted there's the ARPA fund, but it, it does become part of their overall commitment. Where if it's coming out of here and it, we hate to use this term, but in a sense, you're paying cash for it. The taxpayers benefit. Mm -hmm. That's out of the, are you talking about the capital account? No, no the special revenue fund. Special. That you have like 231000 sitting there. Now, I realized that you probably have some salaries coming out of there. Yeah. Um, and I looked compared to 22 to now, um, you've had a nice increase in, in the balance on that. It's like 45000 or something. Yeah, and, you know, I've even, I've been pretty transparent and pretty open about this. If, if the ARPA funds were not there to fund that, and this didn't pass through capital, this year would be the year to do that. And okay. I think we've seen that in the first three or four months of having a full-time program manager, is we're able to sustain what we used to. Right. The gain is not much more than it was prior to that right now, but we haven't really hit the busy season for us, except for this month, yeah. which is not included, but um, I think we we could. So if you're asking me if the ARPA funds don't go through, would I fund pickleball? Yes, I would out of the okay. special revenue. Okay. So do you do any synergy with the senior center and offering recreational activities? Yeah, that and that was part of one of the uh, needs analysis that came back this year is a lot of people want um, programming for you know older adults in the community. Um, that was sort of a need and a want. So we, that was part of the reason why we hired the program manager, not manager that we that we brought in. Excuse me, keep calling it program manager, but it's a, a program lead position. Uh, we have been meeting monthly with the senior center at the library. Um, the um, Joanne. Yep, um, and uh, Chatham Health is part of that. Um, and we've been um, sort of discussing and trying to not overlap with each other and come up with program offerings that you know, fit the needs for um, older adults in the community. So, you know, we do a rowing program that we're going to be offering again this summer. That was a, that was a big one for uh, people between the ages of 45 and even 80 years old. Uh, we were getting people uh, that were coming out for the rowing program. But Pippa Ball is a big one. We've got a couple of sessions out there. Um, I know my program lead now is communicating with um, uh, Joanne to do some bus trips uh, for the, for the, um, Older population as well, so uh, there is that coordination going on and that effort going on currently. So, I see here you want to partner with the local businesses and so forth. Yep. What you just mentioned are all town. Yeah. So, so I'll give you an example of that. We're actually National Trails Day is June third um, every year. This year, we're actually trying to is it in communications with them today. Build National mm -hmm. Trails Day to have people come down through the, the business district 
uh, from the airline trail so that they can connect and go into the shops at the local businesses this year. Uh, that'll be happening on June 3rd. And so far we have a lot of, um, you know, businesses down there looking to partner with us on that. So uh, the library does some stuff with them as well. Our, you know, trunk or treat event is brings in over 2000 people to that. Um, they all, the, the downtown business district uh, does their own thing at the same time in, in coordination with us uh, to get people into their storefronts as well. Um, the Easter, uh, Easter egg hunt is another one um, that we do in the downtown district uh, that brings people to the storefronts. So we are constantly um, trying to collaborate with them. on different programs. So you're not really doing exercise programs with a local business? No exercise programs, no. We're just, the idea is that we try to bring people to the downtown district to get them to go into their storefronts. Is that, make, is that what you're asking about? The businesses in the downtown district don't really offer. Well, exercise. see, I would see that as economic development. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a little bit of both. We're trying to, I, do, I don't, like but we don't I, have any opportunities. You the, say partner with local businesses in the leisure and recreation fields to expand resources and offer programming for adults such as Zumba, aerobics, karate, yoga, often use, utilizing their facilities. So who are you working with? For that particular piece? We're yes. really, I mean, the senior center, which is in the downtown district. So uh, you're not temporary. partnering with like, what is it? Every time fitness or no, no, we haven't done anything with them in many years. But no, as far as a fitness center program, no, we're not doing any of that right now. There's nothing to say we won't or we can't. Um, different things happen throughout the year that we constantly say, hey, this would be a great idea to incorporate this business or that business. But as far as exercise programs, um, there's nothing right now that uh, there's a business that we're working with. It would be nice to be able to do that type of that type of stuff, but you know, we're working through different things right now and how we can best provide for the downtown district and what we're doing. You were working on something in combination with downtown with the airline trail, right? Yeah, that's the one I was just talking about. So yeah. the the, tra the national trail so is that fit third. into that category. Well, yeah, so we're trying to bring people into that downtown area mm -hmm. through hiking. So National Trails Day is a big day for us in the trail community um, where we can bring them along the trail. We'll start from Cranberry Bod. We'll have four stations that'll end um, mm -hmm. in the downtown district. And along those stations, they can learn about the history of the airline trail. And when they get down into the business center, we can talk about the history of the businesses that are down, or down there or um, and sort of advertise those. And, There'll be some raffles that we do with that nature. No, Still in the it's right here. Partner with local businesses in the leisure and recreation fields to expand resources and offer programming for adults such as Zumba, aerobics, karate, and yoga, often utilizing their facilities. Jeremy, who are your so, outside providers? So, yeah, you that's. This? You, I think you're getting a little tied up with the exercise part of it, but for example, we use um, the art center in town. Um, Amy Ordonez, she has an art studio in town and we were using her studio for art classes for adults and even kids. Um, you know, the bikes, the bike shop in town will constantly do, they'll be part of the, the June day doing helmet fittings and, you know, uh, renting bicycles during, you know, the airline trail cleanup days or, so we do partner with those businesses. I, the exercise part of it might have been just sort of, a, um, there are no now there are no places down there that you can go to an exercise. So you're just limiting it to the village center? Well, that's a big boost for us to try. I mean, we can do it to anybody, really. I'm not just limiting it. But we have other businesses around, right? Absolutely. Anybody that wants to partner with us, we will. It's just the business center is sort of a hub for the space that we use at Center School Grounds. It's the biggest space that we have available to us. And when we do outdoor events, we like to be there. Uh, we're, we're trying to... We're trying to bring people to that Main Street area as well. But I'm never going to turn anybody else away. Uh, if somebody else has a studio, a Zumba studio, we're going to partner with them. And we have in the past. It's not one currently, but. It needs to be the kind of programs that could actually work for the senior center if you got, you know, somebody's face and to help the senior center right. program. Yeah. So your, your person has the bandwidth to handle 
helping with developing those programs. Yeah, and when we work with the senior center, we can, you know, be in coordination and efforts to to build on that. So yeah, absolutely. I think this extra person that we brought on is a is a big part of what that that role is, is okay. to coordinate those efforts. And they currently are as we speak. Well, maybe not right now, they're opening now, but during the day they that's what their job is, is to facilitate those programs or to coordinate those efforts to get us all in a room, brainstorm and then put them in, in place. So, but it's always been a focal point for us to, to you know, get involved with the downtown business district. And any businesses that want to cover them. And that would be things like asking Stop and Shop to maybe pop up some money and sponsor some kind of event. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the Stop and Shop was one of our biggest sponsors when we did the playground yeah. three years ago. You know, they donated all the food. Yeah. Um, you know, American Distilling was part of it. So, you know, Ace Hardware is a huge contributor to their our golf tournament every year. And, you know, we put up advertising for that. So, you know, we definitely do it in all aspects. It's just, uh, there is a big focus for us to try to help the downtown district and yeah. Yeah, people can drive down that way. Go down that way. Tennis courts have a crack, huh? What's, what's that? The tennis courts high school have a crack? No, so the crack is right down the middle of where the net is. It's a normal crack. I trust me, that was the first thing I saw. And it's a so when when they make the um, when they seal the the concrete underneath it, the asphalt underneath it, that's where they want it to spread. Is right at those oh. when it when it expands and contracts with the winter and the cold weather, that's where you're going to see them. So they're not structural. That's a normal thing on So it's right down where the nets go all the way down, and that's where that seam is. And they said that's a very normal thing. Don't worry about it. It reassured me that it's not an issue. So <laughs> trust me, I asked Dave. That was the first thing I saw. And I'm like, Dave. Hey, He's like, don't panic, just call him. For warranty, like. <laughs> um, that's, I was right on the phone, and yes, yeah, like, I was reassured that it was fine. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about capital related items? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going to have and. I'm going to go to the back page because I know that identifies. You want me to talk, talk about ARPA too or the projects that are yeah. that are in there? You've got. All right. So the Skag Turf Tiger, um, you know, as you can see by the hours, as we start to get around the 2,000 man hours, uh, we start to look at replacement of our Skag Turf Tigers. Um, the quote that you see here is, you know, it includes a bagger on the back. If you have a bagger, it just helps clean up. Obviously, during the fall season, more than anything. Um, so that $19,000 is in there for this year to replace our oldest Skag. Um, that oldest, there is another Skag that's not, no longer being used at the Board of Ed, the old Board of Ed. Um, that we'll look to try to trade in against hackers and um, leaf blowers and things of that nature. Our oldest one. Um, phase three of the airline trail project, uh, 15,000. Um, that's sort of something we've asked for year on year, year in and year out. Um, with any kind of grant that we receive, whether it's federal or a state grant, there's always a match contribution. So it's usually 20%. So we just try to make sure that, you know, whatever we don't do for in-kind contributions, we have a buffer a backup. And these not only help with that, but, it, you know, if we have to do repair projects but throughout the year, which if anybody is a frequent walker on the airline trail, you see the one that we just did on Florida Street. Public Works was great about coming up to our aid there and helping fix that. But we always have watch out and problems. One of the things that people don't understand or they, they don't think about when you know, talking about the airline trail, it is state property, but when we receive grants from them to finish it, they look at the town to, to provide the maintenance on that. Um, so we, I think we do a really good job of maintaining and trying to keep up our trails, but it's a, it's a constant time. It really is. So it's always, it's always good to have money in a, in a account that we can use when needed to do our major repairs. And uh, the pickleball courts at Sears Park, um, you know that's in there as well for fifty-five thousand this year. Sure, go here. Yeah. Um, to repair that, um, that last year we asked for fifty. The fifty-five is inflation, uh, increase in material costs and things like that. So I anticipate that that'll be right around that number. If it goes over, 
something again we have to start together but i don't believe that we're going over that budget so, so jeremy that yeah. goes where the existing skate park space is yeah the old skate park right next to the um, basketball courts we could fit one uh, pickleball court in that area so it'll be, it will take that fence down as well rebuild the fence out and then do all asphalt try to match it up with the tennis court as well or the basketball court too and the basketball court reconstruction it's just it's time um, it, the asphalt there is just is coming apart there's you know bumps in it um, it's time to resurface the basketball court um, so again that that price went up uh, a little bit from last year due to material costs and inflation um, tennis court reconstruction 180 that is a full reconstruction that'll take uh, the asphalt that's currently on the top mill it down two inches come over with a, a new asphalt surface of two inches, and then we'll obviously come in with the, uh, the top surface, uh, the top surface, stripe it, we will put pickleball stripe lines on there. It'll be new, um, it'll also include new fencing around the, uh, the top squares. And uh, the top dressing in the North Field um, at 10,000, um, yeah, that'll, if, if one thing that's a big thing, a big contributor to having fields be well maintained is to make sure that you're constantly filling the holes. And those fields up there get used more than any field and year round, pretty much, except for the winter ones. Um, so it's important that we top dress it with topsoil um, and fill those holes. Um, you know, each field should get it every two to three years uh, with the top dressing. We did it last year, uh, we did sand on three of the fields, and this will be enough to do. North field and softball field. So you'll see that in there as sort of a rolling thing each year. Um, that's, and then uh, the conservation's coming up. The Conservation Lake Commission will be here Thursday for that. So those are those are really what we're we're talking about here. Any more questions? I don't know. But yeah, we're all good. Yep. Yeah, I'm good seeing everyone again. I'm going to see Alana every month in the meetings. Fill her in all the time. What's going on? Oh, motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.